Okay, I do see that it is recording. All right, so let me go ahead and do my introduction. Uh, Brian Scherer obtained his MA in Cinema Studies from New York University's Tisch School of the Arts in 2019. This past February, he presented research at the Southwest Popular American Culture Association Conference in Albuquerque. Brian is applying to PhD programs and in the initial stages of writing a book on disaster movies. Yes. Uh, and uh, Brian, the floor is yours. Why don't you introduce the title of your presentation as well? Okay, so, um, so my, my uh, paper is uh, on the Poseidon Protocol or the pedagogy of, uh, I, forget, I didn't have the actual title of my presentation. It's just, um, it is, uh, yeah. So it's just, just consider it the Poseidon Protocol. Okay, I didn't mean to throw you off there. I just, I didn't have it handy myself. So, okay, all right. So, so this paper contains spoilers. Just so you know. Uh, so remember that movie where a strange virus was introduced into the population. People grew ill with mysterious symptoms and were quarantined in hospital containment rooms, dying in ever increasing numbers. Panic ensued. Government soon the government restricted the public's movement in an effort to harness the spread of the virus. In no time, cities came to resemble militarized zones with an endless parade of law enforcement vehicles patrolling the streets and ambulances carting the infirmed off to hospitals. Can you guess the movie? That's right. It's the one we've been living in for much of 2020. <laughs> Theorist Steve Neal argues in part that, quote, genre is a multidimensional phenomena, a phenomenon that encompasses systems of expectation, categories, labels and names, discourses, texts in groups or corpuses of texts, and the conventions that cover them all. Accounting for variations, salient motifs generally identified as composing a disaster film include a large, com a large cast composed of famous and or semi-famous names who are brought together to experience the disaster, a cataclysmic event, whether occurring at the outset of the film or at the climax, a melodramatic element that may consist of a love story, or notable or particularly poignant death, and the children that are placed in perilous danger but miraculously survive. Products of the subgenre known as the disaster movie are, according to the theorist Stephen King, quote, said to be born out of times of crisis, end quote. In the first few months of the COVID-19 pandemic, it seemed that every day a new development or benchmark would be achieved, indicating that society was fulfilling the blueprint provided by the mainstream disaster movie. With disaster film conventions in mind, as more and more actual story beats began to be reached, a roadmap of sorts came into focus concerning the trajectory of this real-time disaster. I wondered if we contextualize our current state of affairs within the disaster film, could society to some degree gauge where this contemporary crisis may lead or better yet, end up? Taking for granted that most disaster films structure themselves with a progressive beginning, middle, end composition, we can contemplate when certain real world beats are hit within the narrative timeline. Following the paradigm of much of, of dramatic storytelling, we will refer to the beginning portion as, act, um, as act one, the middle of the film as act two, and the concluding chapter of the movie as act three. In homage to disaster film lineage, I shall title the current COVID-19 disaster film deconstructed herein, The Poseidon Protocol. Act one. In the movies, act one introduces the viewer to the world of the film known as the diegesis. The spectator is introduced to the characters, both main and supporting, their connection, if any, to one another, and the circumstances surrounding their relationships to the future disaster. Let's examine act one of 1970s airport. The viewer is brought into the bustling sphere of Lincoln International Airport on the night of one of the worst snowstorms in history. We are introduced to the story's two main protagonists, airport general manager Mel Bakersfeld and his womanizing brother-in-law, pilot Vernon Demarest. Bakersfeld and his colleague, Tanya Livingston, are called into action when a taxiing aircraft becomes stuck in the snow. Bakersfeld summons engineer Joe Petroni to lead the rescue effort. It is revealed that Demarest's girlfriend, stewardess Gwen, is pregnant with Demarest's child, establishing the melodramatic element of the plot. We are presented with Ada Quonset, the stowaway, looking for a way to inconspicuously board the aircraft for a free flight to Rome. 
The story also introduces D.O. Guerrero, the financially desperate passenger who smuggles a homemade bomb on board, forecasting the action element that will figure later in the film. Act one of the Poseidon Protocol was situated in the first few months of 2020, as the country was, and in many ways still is, buzzing about, distracted by politics. With the 2020 United States presidential election on the horizon for November, the primaries were in full swing, culminating on Super Tuesday on March 3rd. Camouflaged amongst the ubiquitous political stories, though, were rumblings about a puzzling flu-like coronavirus that was working its way through the Wuhan region of China. In late January, the United States was outwardly business as usual, but at JFK, SFO, and LAX airports, ominously heightened security measures were implemented for passengers arriving in the U.S. from the afflicted Chinese region. On February 5th, more than 3,600 passengers aboard the cruise ship Diamond Princess were quarantined on board after an outbreak of what would come to be known as COVID-19. A few days later on February 7th, Dr. Li Wenliang, a Chinese physician who had tried to warn the world about the possibility of widespread infections were the outbreak not contained in China, passed away from its effects. The snowball effect was strengthening. Disaster was looming. On February 23rd, Italy issued lockdowns for towns in its northern Lombardy region as positive tests for this novel coronavirus exploded in the area. Soon thereafter, nations around the globe began to report infections. Both Iran and Brazil were quickly identified as hotbeds of virus activity. Then on February 29th, the unthinkable yet inevitable happened. Word came that the United States had reported what was believed to be its first coronavirus death, a man in Washington state. The primary disaster of any generic disaster film tends to punctuate the end of act one. Allowing for storytellers to freely construct plot points within their narratives, the primary disaster could conceivably be mapped to occur in filmic time at approximately the one third mark, although this is certainly not always the case. In 1972, Skyjack, the revelation that a bomb has somehow been smuggled on board the airplane, occurs at 14 minutes, 34 seconds of a 101 minute movie. And although 1996's Independence Day begins its story with the panic in the streets in response to strange, strange atmospheric phenomena, the first true alien attack occurs at 46 minutes, 35 seconds of the movie's 145 minute running time. On the other hand, the spark that ignites the towering inferno occurs at just 12 minutes, 43 seconds into that film's 165 minute runtime. In the Poseidon Protocol, Washington became the state with the most coronavirus infections in the US until it was surpassed on March 9th by New York State, where a particularly concentrated number of cases in the New York City suburb of New Rochelle had been identified. Chiefly due to the population density of New York City, its suburbs, and the overall tri-state area, as well as New York City's status as a particularly vital organ of the American anatomy, the New Rochelle outbreak could be construed as the primary disaster. Act two. In the aftermath of the primary disaster, all hell breaks loose. This is the meat of the narrative and the section in which the majority of the action and plot elements are expounded. It is within act two that Reverend Scott and his motley companions must journey to the top or rather the bottom of the overturned SS Poseidon to questionable safety or when Jack and Annie must maintain a speed of over 50 miles per hour in order to prevent the bus from exploding and killing everyone on board. After the New Rochelle outbreak was exposed in the Poseidon Protocol on March 3rd, and as word and rumor about this novel coronavirus rapidly spread, bonafide public panic took over. Retail stocks of hand sanitizer, Clorox wipes, and in particular toilet paper quickly depleted. Demand for product was so intense that convenience stores and corner bodegas could barely keep these items on the shelves, and Amazon inventory consistently seemed to indicate a status of currently unavailable. It is within this backdrop of hysteria that unscrupulous price gougers began to surface, despite the government's warning of steep consequences for those apprehended. In March, the New York Times reported on a Tennessee man who, along with his brother, went to great lengths to score thousands of bottles of hand sanitizer for which the men were then busted for reselling for hefty markups online to desperate consumers. Eventually, local government, not to mention the media, intervened and ordered the men to cease selling these items. In the terrifying uncertainty that characterizes much of Act Two, decisions are made that, for better or worse, shape the outcome of events. 
In Twister, for example, Bill and Joe attempt to warn their rival storm chaser, Jonas, that the direction of a major tornado is shifting squarely into his path. Jonas, his ego trumping his common sense, ignores them and his hubris results in his death. In the Poseidon Protocol, main protagonist, Governor Andrew Cuomo's controversial March 25th directive that nursing homes across New York State must admit confirmed or suspected COVID-19 patients from taxed hospitals was a dramatic mandate that may have resulted in thousands of COVID-related deaths. In the Poseidon Protocol, the unreliable or conflicting information concerning how this virus was spread caused misgivings in people concerning leaving their homes, especially once restaurants, bars, gyms, movie theaters, Broadway theaters, and other social venues began to shut down. On March 13th, co-protagonist President Donald Trump formally declared a national state of emergency. In late March, early April, ever more states across the nation issued stay-at-home mandates that residents not leave their homes except for the most essential activities. The panic was in full force and the population lay in wait, much like the party attendees in the towering inferno, wondering when and if they would be saved from a fiery fate. A major benchmark that must be achieved in act two of any worthy disaster film is the unfortunate death of a prominent supporting character or characters. Less often, a main character will be sacrificed. Gene Hackman in The Poseidon Adventure or Bruce Willis in Armageddon, for example. In fact, part of the morbid fun in disaster movies is guessing who will and who won't survive said disaster. Sometimes the supporting character death is the ostensible villain, such as Richard Chamberlain in The Towering Inferno or Marjo Gortner in Earthquake. But more often than not, the, su the supporting character death is of a sympathetic character whose death serves to function as a melodramatic plot point. Lee Strasberg in The Cassandra Crossing, John Favreau in Deep Impact, Jeff Daniels in Speed, and perhaps most famously, Shelley Winters in The Poseidon Adventure. The February 7th death of Dr. Lee Wenliang might be thought to inhabit this story strand. However, I would posit that due to the orientation of Dr. Wenliang's death near the beginning of the Poseidon Protocol, his death served more as a portent of impending doom than a true supporting death. A more appropriate supporting death in the narrative would arguably be that of Broadway actor Nick Cordero. Mr. Cordero had been admitted to the hospital on March 31st with what he thought was pneumonia. Unfortunately, his condition rapidly deteriorated and after testing positive for COVID-19, doctors put him in a medically induced coma so they were better able to control his breathing. Later, issues concerning blood clotting resulted in doctors having to amputate Mr. Cordero's right leg, an especially bittersweet circumstance considering Mr. Cordero's status as a Broadway performer. His wife, Amanda Klutz, had been updating fans and well-wishers regarding Nick's progress on her Instagram feed throughout his hospitalization, building up an enormous outpouring of sympathy from the Broadway community and beyond. Nick's story held tremendous resonance because here was a young, Nick Cordero was 41 when he died, happily married man with a young son, otherwise healthy and energetic, whose illness fortified the reality that if COVID could happen to a young and virile Broadway star, it could happen to any of us. Everyone was pulling for Nick to get well so he could return to his wife and son, but he tragically passed away on July 5th. Act three. Subsequent to the primary disaster, there is traditionally a second disaster that signifies the beginning of act three. I refer to this plot element as the law of the second disaster. By now, the primary disaster is well underway and steps have generally been taken to contain it. Before the audience can return to complacency, however, the second disaster materializes. This disaster may be less in severity than the primary or might even be the centerpiece event of the film the primary having been merely an elaborate warm-up. The Titanic is sinking, and jeopardized passengers are desperately trying to escape via the too few lifeboats when, in the second disaster, the ship splits in two, plunging the ship to the Atlantic floor. Or, after the massive volcanic eruption, an explosive pyroclastic cloud engulfs the town of Dante's Peak and traps our heroes as they try to escape. Having invaded globally in late January 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic traversed a terrifying course throughout several major cities in the United States, yet no city weathered such devastation more than New York City. According to the CDC, the seven-day moving average of COVID deaths in New York City was reported as six on March 21st. Just one week later, that number would jump to 89, and a week after that, the number would climb to 226. 
By the third week of April, the seven-day moving average of COVID deaths in New York City had hit an apex of 1,193. With the death toll rising to horrifying heights, food shortages, shuttered storefronts, and deserted streets, the American landscape had come to resemble a biblical apocalypse. Although the death toll was staggering, New York State was actually beginning to see the number of deaths from COVID-19 decline around this time. In fact, Governor Cuomo delivered ironical good news on October 18th that the death toll in New York State was, quote, past the plateau and starting to descend, end quote. By May 2nd, the seven-day moving average of COVID deaths in New York City had fallen to 287. In the thaw of spring, New Yorkers that had been cooped up for, more often than not, in their tiny apartments for the previous two months began to brave the outdoors. Neighborhood bars offered isolated city dwellers a measure of socialization with to-go cups. Many of the city's restaurants had set up auxiliary dining rooms on the street in front of their establishments. And the mayor's office ordered that certain city streets be closed to through traffic during the day in order to expand the city's valuable outdoor leisure space. New York City exhaled. But right on cue, the Poseidon Protocol presented its second disaster, the May 25th shooting death of George Floyd by Minneapolis police officers. Public outcry was immediate and impactful. Large scale, sometimes maskless protests took place in cities all across the country. The Black Lives Matter movement mobilized in huge numbers and due to violent confrontations between civilians and police resulting from chaotic protests and rampant looting, cities nationwide enacted curfews in an effort to keep residents safe. In the wake of the protests, calls for police departments across the country to be defunded arose. In some cities like Minneapolis, they were. In other cities like New York, police budgets were severely shorn and funds reallocated to other social initiatives. Policemen and women paradoxically assumed the role of villain to be fought and destroyed. Frustrated at the increasing critical scrutiny of their profession, many in the police force took early retirement while others were too frightened to actually police for fear of legal or physical reprisal. People were downright scared as lawlessness appeared to rule much of the land, at least New York City. Act three, however, is typically when the story wraps up. Narrative threads are closed, final action scenes are staged, conflicts are hopefully resolved, villains are either caught or killed, and the drama comes full circle. Charlton Heston swoops in and pilots the damaged aircraft in for a safe landing, and Joe and Bill successfully withstand the F5 tornado. In the Poseidon Protocol, the resolution is still conjecture, but after a summer of violence and death, the story caps with an epilogue. Epilogue. Much like those rescued from the Titanic, as they reflected upon the tragedy they'd endured, the cast of the Poseidon Protocol pondered events of 2020 with a collective sense of melancholia, of where do we go from here, on lessons learned, of mistakes made, of those lost. Much like the Poseidon Adventure, Dante's Peak, San Francisco, Outbreak, Earthquake, Twister, The Day After Tomorrow, Avalanche, and even Jaws, the Poseidon Protocol has reinforced the, con the concept that Mother Nature is not to be underestimated. When the unsuspecting public is most vulnerable, she makes her presence known in a profound way. Like Shelley Winters in The Poseidon Adventure and Jennifer Eel in Contagion, the Poseidon Protocol has shown us instances of self-sacrifice. First responders, doctors, nurses, neighborhood grocers, and food delivery men and women were testimony that disaster will give rise to heroes. During the first few months of the COVID-19 pandemic, con confined New Yorkers opened their windows and shouted in appreciation of these heroes at seven o'clock every evening. Despite this, we knew from the kickbacks Simmons received from using substandard materials to build the glass tower in the towering inferno, or from the pirates plundering for treasure on the shipwrecked SS Poseidon and beyond the Poseidon adventure, that there would be instances of people seeking to exploit the fear and vulnerability of others. We saw it with the price gouges in Tennessee and with states that naively lifted lockdowns too early, only to account for upticks in COVID-19 infections. But most of all, disaster films like the Poseidon Protocol have informed a measure of hope that society would persist and push forward, emerging battle-scarred yet stronger and wiser. The elderly rose tosses the heart of the ocean into the sea, releasing her memories of the Titanic and of Jack. And as we follow the jewel's descent underwater, the wreckage of the doomed ocean liner comes alive and Jack and Rose dance once more by the grand staircase. President Beck's stirring speech to the nation following the comment's, destru the comments destruction and deep impact speaks of humanity's fortitude and of the road to rebuilding a decimated society.
In this chapter of the Poseidon Protocol, the infection rates for COVID-19 are slowing down. In New York State, as of mid-June, the seven-day rolling average of positive COVID-19 cases was at 1% and has remained at that rate throughout the balance of the summer as people confront their new normal. Previously, strict lockdown orders have been prudently lifted as cities and economies throughout the nation conduct phased reopenings. The looting and curfews that paralyzed cities earlier in the summer have largely abated, though protests in the wake of other high-profile deaths such as Breonna Taylor and Jacob Blake continue while parents, educators, and government officials adapt to a very different school year. Life in the age of COVID-19, while irrevocably changed, cautiously resumes. Masks are required, social distancing stipulations are enforced, some public venues such as movie theaters and holiday parades remain closed or canceled. Nonetheless, human ingenuity and resourcefulness have allowed for drive-in movie theaters to experience a heartwarming resurgence and for virtual technology platforms such as Zoom to connect families, coworkers, colleagues, and friends. There remains no vaccine for COVID-19 and the story is far from over, but befitting the conclusion of the best disaster movies in the Poseidon Protocol, the human race perseveres. Protests in the name of social justice take place and people look ahead with careful hope. We take the lessons of our past to construct our future. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And again, very efficient. It landed exactly at 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs>